Okay, so in the exercise for three base methods, we have six questions uh, in the conceptual part. So let's start with the conceptual questions. The first one was about creating uh, the uh, two-dimensional feature space and how the partitions uh, show up there We're using the recursive binary splitting. So in this example, the data that was provided was from uh, figures 8.1, So this is the uh, result of the decision tree. Uh, here in the example, they use a GD tree. And then this is what the uh, recursive binary splitting shows as the final result. Um, I don't think this was necessary to be created with uh, R. We could uh, easily create this with uh, by hand also. So R1, R2, R3, these are all the uh, sections or regions that are created after we split. Uh, for example, for R1, uh, the split is made with weight uh, as the first feature. Uh, actually, the first one is age, age less than 40. So this is the first uh, split that is made. At that point, there, there are only two regions, the one on the left and the one on the right. And then as we do further splitting, then we create a total of six regions. Any questions about this? Okay, question number two was about this equation on uh, boosting. For boosting, we know that uh, boosting works with creating decision trees, which are then added sequentially. And uh, the, the question was that using only one depth trees, which are also called as terms, uh, we get to an additive model. So uh, how do we show that this is the case given that this is the equation? So uh, for one step uh, or one depth trees, we have this equation where we have one tree uh, represented using this part, uh, f uh, of x uh, with uh, b and b is tree uh, representing, uh, b uh, representing the tree. And uh, if we have one uh, depth tree and we have one depth tree, that means that it is based on a single uh, variable or predictor, which means that when we uh, sequentially uh, grow the tree or make changes to the tree based on the residuals, we are essentially adding uh, the result. So the resulting model is an additive model. But if we have more than one variable, or more than one predictor, then that would mean that it's no longer uh, just additive model. There will be interactions between variables. Uh, next question was about uh, Gini index and entropy. Uh, and they wanted to see uh, if uh, the proportion of a given class is, uh, if we plot it, uh, from zero to one on x-axis and y-axis, we show the values of Gini index, classification error, and entropy. So in this setting, because there are only two classes, zero or one, we have proportion for, let's say, class zero uh, as PM and uh, the class one as one minus PM two. We can also do it the other way, uh, which is more uh, conventional, I think. PM1 would represent uh, the proportion for class one and one minus PM2, the proportion for class zero. Given these equations for uh, the, the measures, gene index, entropy, and classification error, uh, if we plot this, on x-axis, we have those proportions, and on y-axis, we have gene index, classification error rate, and entropy. And we see, as was discussed uh, in the book, that uh, all of these measures are, they have the highest value uh, when we are in the middle of the proportion. So if the, uh, if we talk about entropy, for example, uh, there is less purity 
when we have 50% of class zero and 50% of class one. So that's why we have the highest value. So ideally we want the minimum value, the smallest the value, the better that represents higher purity. So a higher value here, the maximums represent the least purity. Question number four, uh, this is sketch the tree corresponding to the partition of the predictor space uh, as was shown in figure 8.12. Uh, the numbers inside the boxes indicate the mean of y with each region. So this is again created with GD tree, but we can also create it by hand. So this is based on uh, these rules, x1, x2, uh, at different uh, cut points s. The next part here was create a diagram similar to the left-hand panel, figure 812 using the tree illustrated in the right-hand panel. You should divide up the predictor space to the correct regions and indicate the mean for each region. So if we create that predictor space, uh, the first part here is x1 less than one. So here, the next one is less than one. This is the line that we would create and that would divide the region into two space, uh, two parts, and then we further make uh, the splits based on x2 less than one or the left region. So that would be here, x2 less than one. So we end up with this region and we continue doing the binary splitting uh, using this and uh, build this uh, region space. Question number five, suppose we produce 10 bootstrap samples from a data set containing red and green classes we then apply a classification tree to each bootstrap sample and for a specific value of X, produce 10 estimates of probability of class is red given X. So these are all the probability values that we have. Uh, so uh, here they say that there are two ways to uh, make a prediction. One is to look at the majority vote approach and the second is to uh, based on the average probability. So here with our uh, what to do first is use the mean function on x is greater than 0.5, so x representing all the probabilities. So this was essentially uh, sum up all the values of the uh, of the probability when it is more than 0.5. And for all those cases, we get them, divide them by the number of cases. That would be the first approach to look at the majority because we are essentially counting uh, the number of cases we have, and it is more than 0.5. Assumption here is that uh, the probability higher than 0.5 indicates that the class is red. Uh, we could have used any other tool, but uh, generally this is used in algorithms. If we use 0.7, obviously this would change. And then uh, the next one is the uh, second approach based on average probability. So all we need to do here is to take the mean of the probability first uh, of this vector and then see if it is more than 0.5. Uh, and based on that, we find that it is in green because the average is not more than 0.5. Question number six, provide a detailed explanation of the algorithm that is used to fit a regression tree. Um, so the, I think the main algorithm is described here. Uh, if we have, uh, if you're doing binary recursive splitting of the data, then the point is that each split, we are looking at uh, the minimum uh, residual sum of squares. So let's say we have three variables. We try all three if we are doing uh, bagging or with random forest, it could be one, two, or three number of variables that we look at. But in a regression tree, uh, ideally we are using all of them uh, if we are only fitting a regression tree and not uh, looking at random forest or bagging. Then for each split, we are looking at uh, variable one, see what is the residual sum of squares after we do the split using that variable, variable two, variable three. In each case, we get the residual sum of squares on both branches. 
and whichever provides the minimum, that is uh, what we will select. Uh, this uh, in this uh, solution then further talks about uh, looking at n number of samples present in each leaf. I think this is optional. By default, decision tree will not uh, consider this, uh, depending on what algorithm we are using. And then uh, pruning is also uh, something that we do after we have created a regression tree. So I don't think this is part of uh, the algorithm. That's something different. Um, because if if we are using the decision trees later for random forest, then we don't need to prune. Okay, in the applied section, uh, question number seven, uh, this is what we did in the labs uh, with the Boston data. We used six uh, variables um, or six predictors. It has a total of 13 columns in the data, one being the response, the 12 others are the predictors. Uh, we tried six uh, with 25 and 500 decision trees. Uh, and here they asked to try different values of number of uh, variables uh, and the number of trees. So one thing that I did not understand in the solution here is uh, uh, if you look at this part of the code, this uh, is looking at the test MSE. So we provide the training data. We also provide the test data. And uh, just to be clear, we have training data with 50% of the total, about 50% of the number of rows of the total uh, rows in the data set. And the test mean squared error uh, is what is obtained using this function. So this test mean squared error, uh, I would assume that if we have 500 decision trees, we will get only a single mean squared error. Uh, but uh, in the results here, we actually get uh, 500 mean squared error values for each uh, of these uh, number of uh, uh, the values of MTRI, which are the predictors, number of predictors chosen uh, at random. Uh, so I'm not sure, let's say, if we uh, restrict to um, only one variable, uh, one as value of mtry, we will get 500 mean squared errors. The plot that is created after this, this would uh, say that if we have a higher number of trees, let's say more than 100 decision trees, then the error that we get uh, on the test data is smaller. This is how uh, you would interpret this plot because we see that with smaller number of trees, the test mean squared error is higher, but with higher number of trees, that starts to reduce because we are averaging from multiple predictions. So as we learned in last week, uh, by when we do that average, we are essentially reducing variance. So that's what I would understand from this plot, but I don't understand why 500 values are created when we are creating uh, a single random forest that is using those 500 decision trees. The result of that single random forest should be a single value of mean squared error. When you plot it this way and interpret it the way I said before, that we have higher number of trees leading to a smaller error, I think that's misleading because what this means is that for tree number 100, we have these errors. For tree number 300, we have these errors. But why is it that for tree number one, the errors are high for all of those trees? So for, for all of these uh, m tri values, whether you use one or two or three, in all cases, the error is higher. What is so different about tree number one in all of these attempts? Yeah, so I'm not, I don't use that package, that random forest package much. I, I use Ranger, but I, I assume what it's doing is that that test MSE 
part of the output is the MSE for each tree, right? So it's not the averaged MSE of each tree. It's it's the individual MSE of each tree. Yeah, I understand that part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that we get, uh, so we have 500 trees, right? So mm -hmm. uh, for example, with sklearn uh, in Python, if we fit a model, a random forest model with 500 trees, we will get uh, a fitted model that we then use for making predictions. So if we have, let's say, 100 rows in our test data, we get 100 predictions. And then we mm -hmm. estimate the mean squared error. That mean squared error value is a single value for that test data using a single random forest model. So in this case, though, when you look at the result, um, I, I ran this code and I looked at the result, we get 500 different values. And that's what is utilized here. Uh, the, the value that we are using here to make this plot, this value is the 500 values for a given M try. So I would interpret this plot as we have, for example, decision tree number 100. And for this decision tree, if we use one M try, then we get this error. If we use 10 M try, then we get this error. So that's how I would interpret it. But looking at the results here, it seems that it's not used that way. It seems that what the plot is saying is that if you have higher number of trees, then you get better results. Uh, why is it that decision tree number one here, regardless of what values you use for M try, you always get a higher error. What is so different about that particular tree, although sometimes we are using uh, M try of 10, sometimes 12, in all cases, it is significantly higher than other trees. So I think what probably mm -hmm. is happening is it's not just fitting 500 trees, uh, sorry, a random forest model with 500 trees, it's actually fitting 500 random forests with yeah. each different number of trees. But it's not I think clear that, in the that... documentation. I looked into the documentation in the examples online as well, but I don't see any ex ex any explanation on this. I think that makes sense because the the if you're averaging the number the trees together, the MSC of the trees, then the variance would decrease as you gain yeah. trees, right? Which is what's shown in the graph. Yeah. So and this is similar, to but but, but it also shows that that, that M dry is is that the number of variables that the split is more important than the number of trees, right? Yeah. In terms of the variance of the error. Yeah. Yeah. So if you put aside the issue of number of trees, then yes, with M dry, as you said, we see uh, that with uh, with in this example, it's five. Uh, with five M dry, we get a smaller error. So this is also similar to some of the examples in the book. So I think it this is what it is doing. It is fitting 500 random forests, each with one, three, two, three, four, and up to 500. Yeah. Trees. Yeah, but the code is not quite uh, obvious. Yeah. Okay, then question number eight is about car seats data, which is a classification issue. Uh, last week we used uh, uh, a variable high that was based on sales. Uh, this time uh, they say to fit a regression tree using the sales directly. And based on that, the code is similar to before. We get this decision tree, which has 16 leaves. And when we look at the mean squared error for this model, we see it's about 4.56. If we do cross-validation for the purpose of uh, pruning the tree, uh, we find that uh, nine, uh, no, eight is the, the smallest number. So if we use a uh, decision tree with eight leaves, then we should ideally get a smaller mean squared error 
on the test data. So we do that. Uh, and I tried it on my own, um, but I got a value of 4.8. Uh, with the original result, we have 4.56. Here they argue that the better result would be obtained if we use 11 terminal nodes, uh, but we still get a higher value, 4.6 rather than lower than 4.56, but it's close. So I would say then why not just use this tree, this one, uh, which which was the original one. We don't need to prune it. We are getting smaller test error with that. Which which tree was smaller? Of those so two? This, this is the original uh, tree where we have sales, yeah. have a function of all the predictors. Uh, here's our training data. And so here we get 16 terminal nodes. And uh, right. when you look at the mean squared error, based on the on that tree, we get uh, this uh, mean squared error on the test data. So here, uh, this is the test data. So we get 4.56. And then as the book discusses, uh, we use pruning to improve the mean squared error on the test data. So with pruning, uh, we, we do that by using the cross-validation method and uh, the cross-complexity pruning is used. So based on cross-validation and um, after plotting it, we find that if we use eight uh, as the number of terminal nodes, then the deviance will be the smallest. Mm -hmm. Um, so I tried with eight terminal nodes. I used this code, but changed best equals to eight. And I got 4.8 as the mean squared error. Uh, with the original tree, we get this much. So 4.8 mm -hmm. is definitely higher. So that didn't give, give us good result. Here in the solution, they used 11, uh, and they still got 4.6. So slightly higher than what we had with an unpruned tree. So I was saying, why not then just use the unpruned tree because that is giving us the best result overall. I wonder yeah. if they're arguing that it's better to have a simpler model yeah, if, the, that, if that, the difference in error is not that great. Yeah, that uh, that makes sense. Yeah, so it is still not too different um, in terms of error, but you're right that the number of nodes are smaller. That's, you could probably translate that into degrees of freedom. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, uh, next, uh, use the bagging approach in order to analyze this data. What test error do you obtain and use the importance function also. So for bagging, uh, because this uh, car seats data set has uh, 10 uh, predictors, we use all 10 of them uh, in the random forest function. This would ensure that we are doing bagging and we say importance equals to true. So this significantly reduces the mean squared error uh, as we see here, 2.76 compared to 4.5 with the original tree and uh, if you look at the importance, then we get a price and the shelf location as the two important variables. Uh, if we remove them, then our mean squared error will significantly increase. Then random forest is used. And in this example, so they say it describes the effect of M. So we could try different values. In this particular example, three is used. And this is uh, still smaller than the original tree, but higher than what bagging provided. But with different values M try, this could further decrease. Then uh, the importance again is highest for price and shelf location. So we should keep these variables to build a better model. Uh, then the Bayesian additive regression trees are used. So with the BART library, 
we use the GBART because this is a regression problem. And the uh, what we obtain here is the y hat test mean um, after fitting this model. And we also give it the x test, which are all the predictors in the test data. So after fitting this, uh, we get the mean squared error of uh, 1.6, which is the smallest in all of these attempts. Question number nine is about foreign juice data from the ISLR2 package. And first, they create training and test set. And we want to, this is a classification problem, so we want to predict whether the juice is uh, the two uh, different uh, classes. Um, it's CH and MM. MM is for a minute made and CH I forgot. Uh, but those are the two classes we are predicting. Uh, here in the question, it says by as, uh, so don't use by uh, as predictor, but I don't see by in the data. Uh, there is purchase, which is the response, um, but I don't see by. So that's why in the code also, we don't see that by is removed. And then uh, when we fit the regression tree, sorry, classification tree, we get this result, eight terminal nodes. And then if we look at the raw result without running the summary function, we get this result. And the question was to interpret uh, any of these lines. But if you look at the first line, this is the key. So the first thing is node, the second is the split, then the number of cases in at that level, then the deviance and the Y validation value, uh, which is the test value and the Y probability. So uh, in this case, we have uh, at the root level before any split, we have 800 uh, as the number of cases that we have uh, and then this is the deviance value. Then CH is the predicted value, Y val. And uh, then we have probability. Uh, so CH is the is class zero. Uh, I, I am naming them as zero and one here because it's two class problem. So the probability for that was 0 0.61. That's why CH was selected. The probability for MM class was 0 0.38. And then if we look at the second one also, here now loyal CH variable is used to make the split. And this is the rule that is used. Then 285 is the predicted, uh, um, is it the predicted? No, it's the number of cases. And then 296 is the deviance. The predicted value is the minute made juice. And the probability for CH was smaller, 0.21 probability for MM was about 80%. That's why MM was predicted. Next part is create a plot of the tree. So just like last week, we use plot and the text functions to create the plot. And we have, uh, as we saw before, eight nodes in the, uh, in the decision tree. Next is making a prediction on the test data and also producing a confusion matrix. So uh, prediction is made using the predict function where we provide it with the test data set and specify that it's a, a class that we are predicting. And then we also give uh, the actual values of the purchase column in the test data, provide both to the table function to create the confusion matrix uh, and the question here was, what is the test error rate? So to create the test error rate, we can find the number of correctly predicted values, which is 125 plus 94 divided by all the values here. That would give us the accuracy. If we minus that from 100, that would give us the classification error rate. Then apply the cv.tree to prune uh, the tree that's used here. 
And then based on that, uh, we see if we use six terminal nodes, then we get the smallest deviance. So that is used in the next part. And once we use the six terminal nodes in the pruned or tree method, we get a pruned tree. And looking at the error for this, uh, we get an error of 0.16. Uh, this is actually the error for the actual tree, and this is for the prune tree. So they are similar. Uh, here they say it's slightly higher, but they're not. Uh, yeah, if we change the seed, then we may get different values. So essentially we get... Yeah, and I wonder if it's values. rounding. Yeah. Um, Next was uh, compare the test error rates between the pruned and unpruned trees, which one is higher. So that's again, the same thing that we were looking at before. Uh, actually that was for training and this is for a test. So this is also uh, to these many decimal places, we still get the same result. Um, okay, any questions so far? Question number 10 was about the heterase data set. Uh, and this was about boosting. So we're now using boosting to predict cell rates. Remove the observations from that cell information is unknown, so that's removed. And then we also take a log of the response with the cell rate. And then we create a training data set uh, based on the first 200 observations and the remaining as the test observations. And then we do boosting using 1,000 trees. And we also uh, need to test uh, different values of the shrinkage parameter lambda. So using that, uh, using the gradient boosting machine library, we first provide some values of the lambda. So the default value in the, in the GBART function that is used here uh, is 0 0.001. So these are the values that were tested uh, in this solution. And uh, for all for trying out all these values, uh, this function was created uh, for, for all lambda values. We are fitting uh, the model, uh, sorry, not GBAR, GBM uh, function. And we provide the training data set, specify that it is a Gaussian distribution because it's a regression problem and specify the shrinkage parameter based on these values. And then we estimate the error uh, after first making a prediction on the training set and then finding the mean squared error. So based on that, we get this plot. On x-axis, we have shrinkage values. On y-axis, we have the mean squared error on the training data. And we see that if we have a higher value uh, closer to one for the shrinkage la parameter lambda, then we get a smaller training error. But how does that affect the test data? So before that, we first create a plot of uh, shrinkage values on x-axis and uh, test set on mean squared error. Yeah, actually, this, this should be the test set not the training set. Um, yeah, so we are using the test set. Uh, it should say test MSE. And so here we see uh, that instead of polar to one, it's 0 0.1 that produces the smallest test MSE. And then they also asked to compare this to other models, linear regression, rich regression, and Looking at the mean squared error on the test set, 0.25, we see linear regression, it is higher with ridge regression is also higher. So boosting is providing us better results. And then uh, this is how we are looking at the importance of the predictors. Uh, so FITS is the model that was created above. This is the boosting model. This is the FITS method that we fitted. And based on that, 
we then create the summary uh, which plots this. So here we see that uh, the top few uh, variables or predictors which are the most important in predicting salary. Next was uh, performing bagging on the training set. So for bagging, we used we use all the uh, predictors. So in this data set, we have 19 predictors. We use all of them and then we make prediction and find the mean squared error. We get 0.23 almost. So this is smaller than what uh, boosting provided. So generally we'll get closer results with bagging and boosting. Depending on the data set, some will provide a higher uh, error than the other. Question 11 was uh, with CAR1 data set, uh, where we're using training uh, set with first 1,000 observations. We do that, create the training in the test set, and then choosing the gradient boosting machine, we are now making a prediction on at the purchase uh, variable, but we are saying purchase is yes. This is our class. So now this is a classification problem. And we have uh, the shrinkage value of 0 0.01 as specified in the question. So based on that, if you look at the results, this would produce the importance of importance plot. Then the next part here was to uh, use the boosting model to predict the response on the test data set. Um, but they also specify that, uh, that we need to predict that a person will make purchase if the estimated probability of purchase is greater than 20%, uh, and also create a confusion matrix. What fraction of people predicted to make a purchase do in fact make one? And how does this compare with the results obtained from KNN or logistic regression? So the first part here is to make a prediction using the fitted model that we created above. Uh, and once we do that, we are now looking at the probability that uh, that the purchase class is yes is higher than 0.2. And we get this confusion matrix. And then when we find the error on that, uh, we get 0.2. Then it is compared to uh, logistic regression. So here we get 0.14. And then it's further compared with KNN, where we get 0 0.086. So we have 8.7% of the cases uh, where we are assuming that probability is higher than 0 0.2 when uh, the class is purchase equals to yes. So KNN can correctly predict 8.7% cases. Logistic regression can do 14%. And our uh, boosted uh, regression tree result uh, was able to do 21%. So again, we get better results uh, with boosting. Any questions about this question? Okay, question number 12, I think this, is this the last one? Yeah, question number 12 was to use any other data set to uh, do the art method. I did not do this one. So, I think this is, uh, in this example, they use college data set, uh, but it's not very different from the other problems that were discussed. I didn't do this one. Any questions about any of the 11 questions? No, so I, um, just, I guess a comment in practice, this is mostly what I use for 
progression problems in my work. I try like a random forest first and see how that does. Yeah. It's flexible and it and it's easy to easy to to set up. Yeah, in my experience also I don't do a lot of machine learning at work, but whenever I do, I generally my tendency is to try out random forest first. And then boosting is something that I have not used uh, before. So this was my introduction to boosting. And I, I think it is also promising. I've heard that uh, gradient boosting and cat boost is another uh, approach. Uh, and I'm excited to uh, see how that works. But I, I think conceptually, I still uh, don't understand the uh, uh, Bayesian additive regression trees well. So that is something I need to work on. Um, I think we can we can stop and then we can discuss the 